Navy SEAL, Fault Bounded, and the Husky Mossad SEAL, which is larger, is right there. The uh, field is in the Cambrian, so this is the reservoir interval, the dotted Cambrian sandstone, and uh, overlying that is salt. Uh, I forget the age of the salt, but it forms a seal to the reservoir. And wherever you get these high areas here, that's where you have your, your structural traps and your field. So the Hasi Massad, as well as the Ruel Bagel field, uh, along these structural highs here. There's another structural high here. And uh, there's another field there, Hasi Armal field. So uh, where you get those structural highs is uh, where you get your reservoir. So there's a primary structural control on the distribution of your uh, reservoir. So Royal Pagel is this one here. And I showed you this uh, picture earlier today where if we looked at a cross section here from DB Prime, um, you had a gas cap overlying uh, an oil zone, the gas cap in red oil zone in green, but if we look down here uh, at this cross section, uh, you get your oil zone, but you don't have any gas cap, and the gas oil contact is right uh, in here, and it butts up against the salt there. So that's your gas oil contact, your oil water contact, what I'm drawing now, it comes across like that. Okay, well, like I said, I had the opportunity to, while I was there, to examine a core, very nice long core. It's located right in here in the oil zone. Okay, so uh, this is a very small picture of my core description. And there were two rock types. There was rock type B, or excuse me, this rock type. And here's kind of an enlargement of part of that. This was the marine sandstone. And then there was uh, this part down here, which was much coarser grained. And it was a uh, graded river type reservoir with a lot of feldspar grains in it. Here you see the two trends, one trend like that, where you get kind of a normal increase in permeability with porosity, and then another trend here, we get a wide range of porosity and all very low permeability. Now, um, why that is, is because of this. Uh, that I didn't show you this morning. Uh, one type of reservoir, one of those two rock types, has a lot of quartz grains and has a lot of interparticle porosity. And so it produces very well. But this one up here is the odd one. And the pore spaces are isolated. And this is because uh, uh, prior to burial, you have deposition of a lot of feldspar grains. And, but then with burial, the feldspar grains, which were dispersed in the matrix, dissolve. And so you get this very discontinuous uh, pore spaces. So you end up with good porosity, but very low permeability here, and here you get more of a normal porosity versus permeability relationship. And I already told you which, which was which. The uh, fluvial one was this one here, and the marine one was this one here. And how did I determine that one was marine and one was fluvial? Well, 
I did that just by examining the core and doing a sentimentology description of the core and things like that. So uh, I didn't, I showed you earlier this morning the profile, the vertical profile of porosity and permeability. So I, I don't show it again, but remember the lower sand, the uh, rated river had high permeability but low, uh, excuse me, high porosity but low permeability. And this one had a normal increase in permeability with an increase in porosity more of a normal relationship. All right, let's look at another example. And uh, let's see, if I, have an extra, I may have an exercise that goes with this one. We're gonna go out to California now where in California there's several giant oil fields, about four billion barrels, something like that, out of this, what is called the Wilmington oil field. And we're gonna look at part of that field called LBU. That stands for Long Beach Unit. Uh, so, it's the southeastern end of the larger Wilmington field. Interestingly enough, part of that field is onshore and it underlies the city of Long Beach, which is a major city. Uh, and then part of the field is offshore, is in a shallow offshore environment. Now if you look at a, uh, this is a structure map, uh, it's uh, fairly shallow. Structural, this is the structural elevation minus 4,000 400 feet minus 4,800 feet, something like that. Uh, so you've got the nose of a structure up here, which is up about in this uh, area right in there. And uh, the city of Long Beach, uh, I think that's the shoreline. No, the shoreline walk further out. At any rate, production is from four platforms and uh, there, at the time I did this work, there were a total of 800 wells off of those four platforms. The platforms are offshore. Here's one, two, three, four, and uh, all uh, with these uh, multiple well uh, coming off those four platforms. The city of Long Beach, uh, I think the shoreline runs something like that. So part of this field underlies the city and then part is the offshore and shallow water. Okay. There is actually one, two, three, four, five different reservoir units the main reservoir unit is this one here called the Ranger Zone, and it's a very, uh, the most extensive, aerially extensive uh, field. This is a little cartoon showing the city of Long Beach and the shoreline here. Then these platforms, this is one of the platforms that is uh, uh, slightly offshore. Well, uh, I had at my disposal to describe this core, I had um, I have uh, four cores, four long cores, each one about a thousand feet long, uh, one from each of those platforms, and uh, that was my database. There was no seismic. Seismic could not be shot because it was too close to the city of Long Beach and people objected to that. So there was no seismic, it was all a well log and core study at 800 well logs, like I say, and uh, the four long cores. It's, uh, as I said, this LBU or Long Beach unit is part of the larger Wilmington oil field. 
of which is about 3.8 billion barrels, and of which 900 million barrels have been produced up to the year 2002. That's the latest data that I have. I'm going to work on the field after that. Now, there's a series of fault blocks, and each one of those fault blocks is cut by faults. Well, excuse me. Yeah. So you've got a fault here and a fault there, and you've got a fault, a reservoir block in between, another fault, another reservoir block, and they're ceiling type uh, faults. And so they make up their own reservoir. Each fault block has its own production characteristic. Again, the ranger zone is the most prolific. Uh, and the sands are unconsolidated, except for they're held together by oil. Uh, porosities and firms are very high, as I'll point out. You have very good long distance continuity of your sand bodies. Uh, the, the sand bodies actually extend from one fault to another within uh, an individual block. So you've got very good sand connectivity up to a fault. And then on the other side of the fault, you have the sand body again. The faults are generally sealing, and each block is its own reservoir. And it's a very mature field. It was uh, discovered, I think, in about 1950 or so. And there have been many recovery techniques that have been applied to this field. Interestingly enough, no one ever cared about the geology. Uh, you just kept drilling wells. And as long as wells were drilled and the oil was flowing, who cares about the geology? It was only when the field started a serious decline that somebody said, maybe we ought to see if there's some geology that's behind that de decline. So again, I was fortunate enough to be the one to do the work. And uh, what I'll show you is what we found. Well, again, I have four 1,000 foot long cores. Uh, and what you're looking at here is just a sampling of 600 individual beds that I measured. There were thousands of individual beds, but I'm just showing you a sampling here of 600 beds. What we found was, the, what I found was the average thickness was 2.0 feet with a standard deviation of 1.8. Now, what I did at that time is I broke the, the sand bed thicknesses into two groups. One group uh, where individual beds were less than two feet thick, I called that thin bedding. And where your beds were greater than two feet thick, I call that thick bed. So here you see a histogram of your thin bed, showing that you've got a lot of thin beds here, and uh, a fewer uh, thick beds, but a wider range of thickness. In fact, we had a couple of beds way out here, about 15 feet thick, something like that, up in the corner. Well, here's a picture showing the thick beds and the thin beds, what they look like in the core. Here is uh, the thick bedded sand. And it's unconsolidated. You can take a spoon and scoop it right out. And interestingly enough, a lot of the thick bedded sands didn't have any oil stain in them. Now, I'll point out again that this is a mature field. Uh, developed in uh, uh, from the 1950s, and it went into water flood, primary water flood, many years ago. So for many years, there's what was uh, this was subjected to a water flood, and it looked like you had really good sweep efficiency <laughs> in the thick bedded sands because you didn't see any oil stain or anything like that. Yet you knew you were in the oil zone. 
But when you went over to the thin bedded sands over here, which is the pictures, <coughs> what you found, <coughs> oh, excuse me, what you found was alternating um, thin bedded sands like this one there, and there's another one here, and another one there. and another one here, and then all of this shinier looking rock was shale. So you have thin beds of alternating sand, shale, sand, shale, and these shales were very hard, uh, very dense. You could pick up a piece of the core and throw it against the wall, and it would bounce back at you. So uh, very dense and very good small scale permeability barriers that uh, separated each of these sands. And the other thing was that most of these sands were oil stained. The dark color here of the sand is uh, oil stained. So this suggested to us that the thin bedded sands, uh, maybe the sweep efficiency of your water flood was not as good as for the thin, thick bedded sands. Remember what I said earlier today that thick bedded sands have higher permeability uh, or excuse me, coarser grain size, therefore higher permeability, and so that probably played a factor in good sweep efficiency up here in these thick bedded sands. Thin bedded sands being somewhat finer grain, so permeability is less, and so your sweep efficiency was not as good, plus the fact that you had all these shale inner beds which were uh, non-porous and non-permeable. Well, here's just a picture of part of my core description, one of my core descriptions. And uh, this column here is porosity. And uh, it doesn't matter that you can't read the numbers here. The point is that there's very little change in porosity all the way down. But here's permeability. And when you look at permeability, you see a significant change. Now, Permeability, and you can't read these numbers, I imagine, but permeability is increasing to from right to left. Okay? So, high permeability here, and then it's dropped off, the lower permeability. Um, and then this was my core description, uh, right in here where we had different types of sands, so the yellow ones, the brown ones, and so on. And the coarsest grain sands, again, were the uh, ones up near the top that were the thick bedded sands, had the best permeability. The thin bedded sands, which were down here, in my core description, more inner bedded with shale, sand shale, sand shale, sand shale, uh, had the lower part of the sands, had, where, where you've made the measurements from the sands, and they had lower permeability. So, thick bedded sands, thin bedded sands, down there in this piece of core. And there was a rather abrupt contact between the two, something like that where you had your contact between thick bedded sands and thin bedded sands. Well, if we look at the uh, histograms, uh, this is from seven, about 1,000 or so, about 1,100 measurements of porosity and permeability from these cores. And uh, what we found for porosity was the thick bedded sands and the thin bedded sands had about the same porosity. Not much change in porosity. The average here, 28 out of 1100 uh, measurements, 28.1 versus 28.3 percent porosity. So very good porosity but not much variation. And the frequency distribution of the porosity is about the same in both cases. But when you got to the permeability, quite a significant difference. 
Now, of your thick bedded sands, your permeability will average 457 millidarcies, but in your thin bedded sands, the average permeability was 288 millidarcies. And that, for 1,100 samples, that uh, when we did the statistics, that proved to be a very significant difference between the thin bedded and the thick bedded sands in terms of permeability. So here is this red line, this red vertical line is uh, shown here, is uh, where the average is. And you can see the average uh, is uh, about the same for thick bedded and thin bedded sands. Um, But here for permeability, higher permeability in the thick bedded sands than in the thin bed, and the red, uh, the red lines refer to the uh, averages. So to kind of sum that up into a simple table, we have the same porosity for thin bedded versus thick bedded, thin bedded versus thick bedded. Permeability is significantly different between thick bedded and thin bedded sands. Now we looked at the, the, we measured the grain size, and as I said before, what you would expect would be a coarser grain size for your thick bedded than for your thin bedded, and sure enough, the average grain size was 0.160 millimeters for the thick bedded sand, and the average grain size a little bit smaller, not a whole lot, 0.143 for the thin bedded sands. So there's an example of that grain size effect I talked about. Now, what I'm gonna show is uh, what I'm gonna, is that uh, significant to how you develop the reservoir. The fact that you've got these slightly different grain sizes, meaning that you had uh, different conditions of deposition. When you had the thin bedded, finer grain sands were deposited under somewhat lower energy conditions than the thick bedded, high, uh, uh, coarser grain sands. And so that difference gave you a slight increase in grain size down here, which affected your permeability. Now remember again, these rocks are, these are sediments, they're unconsolidated, and so there's no cements or anything like that. Uh, a numerical measure of sorting is here, and the sorting was equal, so that did not play a role on the difference in porosity and permeability. And your average bed thickness is 1.1 feet versus 3.8 feet. Okay, now uh, what you see here is a cross section, and uh, I I'm not sure if you can see. Can you see these numbers on your computer there? Can you make out what they are? Or depths? Can you see what the numbers are? Uh, too difficult? 3,000 ah, okay. okay. All right. So what I want to give you is late in the day, just to kind of get your blood flowing again. And then I'll start giving more exercises as we go along the rest of the week. But this will be the first one. What you see here is a plot uh, for one of the wells. Let me go back. Uh, one of the wells is called the A863 well. So that's it there. There's another well, B777, and both of those wells were cored, and we had all that porosity and permeability data for those two cored wells. 
So we go first to the AH-63 well, and what we see uh, now, the shallow part, I'd have put this on its side, but the shallow part is here, and it gets deeper in this direction. So our depth is increasing in that direction. Now what you see is, uh, this is permeability now in an arithmetic scale, and you see quite a few high permeability, well, most of this is a high permeability trend, most of all of that. Some permeability is 3,500 milligarthy, 4,500 4, milligarthy, and uh, here's a 2,000 milligarthy, and so on. So generally speaking, very high permeability. But suddenly you go to a zone where the permeability is much less, less than 500 milligarthies, and that zone occurs at about a depth of uh, 3,600 and thir uh, about 35, 6, 3,635 feet. So if we go back here, that's uh, well number 863, and let's see if we can find that boundary here at 3,635 feet. Look. 3,600, right about here. Okay. Now, if we look at porosity, the same well, A863 porosity, it's about much difference in porosity, a little bit, and that your shallower interval has a little bit more porosity and a slightly lower porosity when you get down there to the deeper part of the well. So not much change, nothing that you could really go to your well logs and uh, put in a significant boundary from higher to lower porosity, like we could with the permeability. So let's go to the B777 well and the same thing, when you look at porosity, not much change. There's a few high porosity interval of, of, of measurements up in there, but generally speaking, about the same porosity. So when we look at the permeability, what we see is, uh, again, an upper zone of um, uh, high permeability and a zone of lower permeability, and the boundary there is uh, right about there, say 3,883, 3,883. Let's go back to our cross section, and that one, 3,883, right about in there. Okay, so what you're looking at then is two zones. One with high permeability here and lower permeability below. Uh, well, this is, this is a pretty easy exercise. Let me do it for you instead of you doing it. All I want to do is correlate the rest of these wells where we didn't have any core data and I think it's easy to see that there's a fundamental difference in your log property. This is a gamma ray log. And you can see that the beds are thick above that line, and they're thin below that line. And the same thing here. Above the line, uh, beds are thick. Below the line, the beds are thinner. So what's that, that is just showing you this uh, sort of effect of uh, bed thickness and permeability. So if you were to take these uncored wells now, all of these uh, five wells in between are not cored, and I think it, it would be easy for you to correlate those across. We have 
a chain from thick to thin bedded right there. We have a chain from thin to thick bedded there. One right there, one right there, and one right there. So a pretty obvious example, and now we can connect them. And so we have an upper reservoir and a lower reservoir. Now remember what I said earlier that when you looked at the core, the upper thick bedded sands looked very clean, like you had a, a good water flood, uh, uh, an efficient water flood. But the sands below didn't appear to have that good effective water flood. And so now you see the reason why, because you've got better permeability up here, poorer permeability down here, and uh, thinner beds down here. So what happened when you, uh, when you did a water flood? You inject your water, and uh, where does the water go? It goes down and stays in your thick bedded sands, your high permeability thick bedded sands. And so you, over time, and this has been on water flood for a very long time, so over time you, you swept, you had a very efficient sweep efficiency for the upper sands, but very little water for water flooding got down into the lower sands. So that boundary turned out to be very important. Turns out to be a, a, a very, geologically it's a very important boundary, it's what we would call a sequence boundary in uh, geologic terms, but I'll get into that later this week. Uh, but the important point now is that this would explain why you had the oil staining down here in these sands, but you had nice clean sands up above. Well, this was a very large field, like I said, 3.8 billion barrels, something like that and it was on a steep decline. And uh, uh, the company wanted some geology that I worked for, wanted some geological input uh, on the assumption that if you have 3.8 uh, billion barrels, I think I said you produced 900 million of that, there's still a lot of oil that you wanna get. You don't wanna give up on this reservoir just because it's starting to decline. So the question was, what can we do now to improve our production uh, in this reservoir and, and kind of um, avoid uh, that uh, decline or, or turn it around so you get better production? And the answer turned out to be pretty obvious. Uh, the uh, answer was to uh, drill some more wells or somehow seal off seal off these upper sands and then inject your water, confine your water down to these lower sands down here because that's where you had your remaining oil. And the company got, uh, after I finished the project, uh, by that time, they were well on their way to getting 200 million more barrels of oil out of this field. And remember, this was a field that had 800 wells on it. It was on a decline. Uh, and still, there were hundreds of millions of barrels of oil still to get. And it just took a little bit of geology. This was not uh, uh, rocket science or anything like that. It just took a little geology to figure this out but no one had paid attention to the geology uh, before, uh, and so uh, that left all that remaining oil uh, to be uh, extracted. Uh, now I will say one other thing about this field. This field, like I said, part of this field underlies the city of Long Beach. And way back when this field was discovered, uh, there were no real restrictions in California on drilling, on spacing of wells and things like that. And you could just, wherever you could drill, you drilled a well. 
And so uh, there was so much drilling and so much production that uh, the city of Long Beach started to sink. In other words, you extracted the oil, you compacted the sediment, and the city of Long Beach, part of it sank under uh, below sea level. And so they had to sandbag it all up and try to figure out what to do. And so after they figured out the problem, uh, after a few years, uh, they were able to pressure it back up again. They couldn't pump it back up above sea level, but they could prevent it from uh, continuing to subside. So very that's a whole another story in itself. But uh, uh, but part of that that part of the field that sat underneath Long Beach, uh, if I remember right, it uh, went down about uh, two or three meters below sea level. So you were starting to flood parts of the city, and uh, uh, the people in the city didn't like that. It's a uh, rather nice city by the ocean, you know, palm trees, all that, like you have here, and except you have the ocean there, too. So uh, at any rate, that's a side story to that. So that was how the problem was corrected, by just peeling off above. Uh, sealing all of this off so all the water was diverted down into the lower perms. And still the permeability was good down here, up to about 500 milligarsies, but uh, not as good as uh, up here. So it ends up something like this. Now, I put these letters in here, BFF and HSP and CSP and CS. I'm not going to go into those now. Those are uh, what we call sequence stratigraphy terminology. And we'll do sequence stratigraphy later on uh, during the week and come back to this example. But uh, let me just point out, this was that boundary right here. And you're in the A863 well. Your perm averaged 1185 milligarsies above and 250 milligarsies below that boundary. Then the, whoops, that's, oh, excuse me, yeah. So this is the porosity curve, and the average porosity above was 24.2, and below was about 23. So not much change in porosity, but a dramatic change in permeability, all because of that grain size effect and the bed thickness effect. In the B777 well, you had an average permeability of a little bit, uh, the, uh, the upper interval was a little bit um, lower, 880 milligarsies average but versus 385 milligarsies below. Porosity is about the same, 29.8, 27.8. And so, uh, uh, again, that shows you the uh, grain size effect. And as I pointed out uh, or once before earlier, I think this morning, uh, all of this is due to your primary depositional processes. With burial, remember I said the structural elevation was about minus 4,500 feet or so below the sea surface, below sea level. And so these had these uh, sands had not been really deeply buried, so there was no cement. There was some compaction, but no cement processes. And so the porosity and firm that you got were really a function of the grain size and that thickness which controlled particularly your permeability. And that goes back up to your primary depositional processes. So what I'm trying to show here is, again, the importance of geology uh, in uh, um, uh, developing your reservoirs or having that understanding, basic understanding of the geology uh, to help you better uh, do your reservoir uh, performance. Now, not all uh, 
sandstone reservoirs behave that way, that general rule right, of uh, increasing grain size, increasing bed thickness, and increasing permeability. Not all reservoirs, there's always in geology, there's always an exception. And so I'm going to show you a couple of exceptions here. And here's a field in the North Sea that I had a chance to work on. And uh, these are faults here, so it's a highly faulted field. Well, wells were drilled, and some of the wells produced very well. For example, this well number four produced uh, 28 million uh, cubic feet per day of gas. This is a gas field. But then you go down here, and this well produced 0.6 million cubic feet per day. You go over here, you're back up to 22, zero here, 15 million cubic feet of gas per day there. So what's going on? You've got all these different uh, differences here. This one, uh, 2 million cubic feet of gas per day. So quite a bit of variability. Well, the people working in this field uh, thinking, well, that's obviously due to frac uh, the faulting. Somehow those faults are controlling the distribution of your, uh, your flow rates, uh, which should depend on permeability and the like. And so I had the opportunity to go and uh, study this. And what I found was... Uh, this is an example of four wells. This well, well number three here, produced 28 million cubic feet of gas per day. Well number four produced 28 million cubic feet per day. Well number one produced 21 million cubic feet per day. And well number five produced 0 0.6 million cubic feet per day. Well, when I was there, I said to the geologist that was working in this field, I said, have you gone and looked at the cores? The geologist said, I didn't have to. We hired a consultant to go and look at the cores and describe them for us. So I said, well, can I see the consultant report? So they showed me the consultant report, and I've simplified it a little bit, but basically it looked something like this. There were two types of uh, sands, a yellow one here, and then this red one, which was uh, actually kind of conglomerate or sandy, pebbly sandstone type, coarser grain, the red one. Yellow sand, little finer grain. But, what you see is about the same amount of um, red as you do yellow in this well, that well, that well, and that well. So you think, well, you know, what, what's wrong here? You know, you're getting uh, course, uh, uh, two different uh, rock types in all four wells, yet your production is so low in this particular well. So that was the question to answer. And I'm going to let you take a look, just to get your blood flowing this time a little bit. Uh, what I put here for well number four and well number five, I put uh, for well number four, and well number five, I uh, have put some columns here of um, uh, thin section work that was done. I talked about thin sections uh, earlier today, uh, that you could determine the mineral composition of your reservoir uh, sands uh, by uh, looking under a, at a thin section under a, a special type of microscope. So how I plotted that here, here's a depth plot, that's this column. I plotted whether sandstone or conglomerate, SS is sandstone and uh, C, 
CG is conglomerate. And then what I put here is the proportion of quartz grains to feldspar grains to ductile lithic fragments. So what you see here then on uh, each one of these numbers, for example, uh, let's just take uh, well number five at 1,200, no, excuse me, 12,125 feet. We did a thin section uh, from a core, and what we found was there was 68% quartz. Twenty-two percent feldspar, and ten percent lithic fragment. Okay, so those total a hundred percent. So those were the three mineral components that made up the reservoir. Now, I think it'll only take you about three minutes at the most, to just look at this data set. Look at this data set for well number four and well number five, and tell me what the difference is. So, or think about it yourself. What is the difference, if anything, in the composition, the mineral composition of uh, the uh, reservoir intervals in well number four and well number five. Anybody wants to volunteer the answer, should be pretty easy to do. Huh? Excuse me? Q means quartz, right? Right. There's more quartz in well number four. Okay. There's more quartz. Is anything missing in well four that's in well five? Yeah, your ductile lithic fragments. Well, ductile means squishy. And so when you bury this reservoir, if you had a bunch of lithic fragments, they're going to, with, with compaction, they're going to squeeze and they're going to get into the pore spaces. And so you're going to lose your porosity and permeability. And so you see for well number five, you see 10%, uh, 10%, 20%, 10%, and so on. But all here, you have 0%, 0, 0, 1%, and so on. So very simple. Uh, geological factor that is controlling the uh, why you've got, for example, 28 million cubic feet per day there and only 0.6 uh, million cubic feet there. You had all these lithic fragments that are squishing up and reducing the porosity and permeability. In fact, all you had to really do is look at the core uh, to tell that there was a difference. And, and uh, when I went over there uh, and, and studied this, and remember I said, had you uh, looked at the core? And the geologist there said, no, I didn't have to because I have the core description from the consultant. And I said, I hope you didn't pay the consultant yet. And well, unfortunately <laughs> they had. But I said, you've really got two different types of conglomerates here in that they combined into this red color. And they're making a difference in your uh, residue your performance, your well performance. And you would never know that just by looking at this. You scratch your head and you know, I don't know why you're not getting any good production here and good production from that well. Well, so uh, when you 
they showed me the core photos on it. I said, oh, we've got to go look at the core because look, you got two different, it's not even the same color. And so we went out and looked at the core and well, number four uh, was very clean. It had quartz and feldspar, but no clay matrix, no ductile fragments, nothing like that. But well, number five, all this kind of uh, purpley stuff is all matrix from these ductile fragments that had bro uh, broken apart and filled in the pore space. So you really just had to go and look at the core photographs. Now with the core photographs, you couldn't tell the mineral composition, but you could certainly tell that there was something different between the two uh, uh, bodies. And so that solved that problem uh, very nicely. So going back to this picture, there was really no structural control at all on the distribution of the reservoirs. It was just a matter of what type of conglomerate was deposited. And you could even draw somewhat of a map uh, that goes where you had one of those lithic fragment ductile grains uh, being deposited in this area. And it's kind of coming through this area here. And then you have the other type of, of uh, sand and conglomerate being deposited over the rest of the area. And that's not uncommon. So again, this is an exception to the rule had no relation to grain size, uh, but in this case it had a positive relation with the, um, uh, with the mineral composition. How about we take about a five or 10 minute just a stretch break, okay? And then we'll go to 5.30 and then call it quits, right? So 